very much indeed for reading for us. And uh, if you could keep pages six and seven open in front of you, that would be a big help. And over the next three Sunday evenings, I want us to imagine that it is in fact two and a half hours later than it is at this time and that we are beyond the nine o'clock watershed. The children are safely tucked up in bed. Adult viewing is now allowed and we are going to be considering Noah's Ark and the Flood in what I'm going to call the Flood for Grown-Ups. So this is not the British Airways flight entertainment editive version that you then show the film to your family and rather regret. This is going to be unedited. Back in the day when I was attending primary school assemblies as a young parent, Noah's Ark was always a favorite in kind of preschool. The animals went in two by two, the elephant and the kangaroo and so forth. And I went on the BBC, uh, C BBC uh, just a, a little while ago to find the most modern equivalent, and here is the BBC's revisionist version. The animals went in three by three, the wasp, the ant, and the bumblebee. The animals went in four by four, the great hippopotamus stuck in the door, so they slightly lost touch with <laughs> what was happening. Here on these three Sunday evenings, no sentimentality or revisionism, and the author of our original text tells us that the account of Noah is an account of cataclysmic judgment, and it's a judgment against the fundamental wickedness of humanity. Just look at chapter 6 and verse 13, or chapter 6, verse 11. The earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence. God saw the earth. It was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Now, if you've been with us over the last two Sundays, you'll know that we're looking at Genesis 5 to 11 under the title of Humanity, What Hope? You'll remember that the author is highly sophisticated. Genesis begins with an introduction, chapter 1, where we're told that God made everything. Then the material is ordered into blocks of material, each block introduced with the phrase, these are the generations. So chapter 2, verse 4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, introduce major block number one, and there we discover the rebellion of humanity against God, followed by God giving humanity over. And then block number two is runs from chapter 5, verse 1, through to chapter 6, verse 8. These are the generations of Adam. Here is humanity. Let me tell you about yourself, says God. And you'll see it's pretty bleak reading. And we learned two weeks ago, you are going to die. And so we get, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died, he died. A great shroud of death hanging over humanity now that we've rebelled against God and God exercises his judgment against us. What's more, chapter 6, verse 5, last week, we saw what we're left with once God withdraws his hand and humanity is given up. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Universal, it's humanity. Absolute, every intention internal, every intention of the thoughts of their heart, constant, only evil continually. So you see, this is no sentimental children's account for the under sevens to sing about in front of their doting parents. This is an account of how and in what way God responds to the wickedness of humanity. No sentimentalism. Nor are we going to allow ourselves to be diverted from a lengthy discussion of the skeptic's objections. I'm sorry about that. I'm happy to go into it at question time at the end of the series. But because the story of the flood is so uh, rooted in the antediluvian mists of time, any number of questions uh, raise their heads. Was it real or is it myth? Was it global or was it localized? Did Noah really construct an ark that floated? And you'll know that some people have actually gone and done the dimensions and constructed their own ark in order to show that such a thing does float and so on and so forth. But we're not going to get bogged down there for long. The author is highly sophisticated. He writes as history. 
So notice he names people and he gives numbers. You won't find that kind of thing in myth writing. Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, seven pairs of all clean animals. He gives precise architectural instructions as if he says, well, go and figure it out. And he gives nautical details and then he gives dates. And we talked about the datings and the extreme age of people a couple of weeks ago, but in the 600th and first year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, do you see? And very specific time periods. So I know there are any number of questions that are raised by this text. Was it mythical? Did it float? Was it global? It's interesting that there are widespread accounts of such an event in most of the literature and folklore of virtually all the world's Aboriginal peoples. And when uh, Planet Earth 2 came up, I was fascinated, you know, I was fascinated by Planet Earth 2, but there we were looking at some beach uh, on the um, Great Barrier Reef, and Attenborough just said, by the by, that in the Aboriginal accounts, there are accounts of a great flood many millennia ago. And you think, oh, interesting, isn't it? And similarly, there are similar accounts in uh, the stories of the Far East, and North American Indians, and in the Middle East, and of course, most famously, in the Gilgesh uh, uh, account in Babylon. And one writer puts it like this, is it not quite reasonable to suggest that the stories have a common origin which Genesis reflects faithfully and the others corruptly? So then, I'm personally convinced that there was a real man called Noah, a real ark, a real flood, and that this was a real event. And if you're following on the handout or on the inside of your um, order of uh, running order, you'll see that's the first point, a real event. But that leaves us asking the question, Noah for grown-ups, so what's the actual point? What's the author's purpose? And I want to suggest that if in the introduction of Genesis we learn that God made everything, and if in block one we learn that God rebelled and uh, that humanity rebelled and God responded in judgment, if in block two we learn that we are now faced with death and the reality of evil, now in block three we're going to see three primary things from the whole account judgment, salvation, and the future of humanity. Judgment, salvation, and the future of humanity. And tonight, I want us to focus on judgment. So just glance back a page to chapter 5 and verse 28 and see what Noah's name means. 5.28. When Lamech When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. He called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And the word relief is tightly, tightly associated with the name Noah. They're basically the same. And so we asked ourselves, well, given that humanity is now plagued by death, and given that God's verdict on humanity is that the thoughts of our hearts are only evil continually. What rest is there then? What relief is there? And now block, major block number three, chapter six, verse nine, nine, these are the generations of Noah. We're going to see that there can only be rest, relief. There can only be a brave new world for humanity if there is, first of all, judgment on all evil. And I want us to show us that from the text. I want us to think about it and realize that it is actually rational. You can argue for it in your office tomorrow morning, and then anybody who doesn't believe that has really got their head in the sand like an ostrich. And then I want us to be prepared to go and speak about it openly. I don't think you can get away, though, from the idea that this is a deliberate event of judgment provoked by sin planned by God. First, provoked by sin. Well, it's there that in verse 6 of chapter 6. The Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man, animals, creeping things, birds of the heaven, for I am sorry that I've made them. It's there again in verse 7. We've done that. It's there in verse 11. The earth was corrupt in God's sight. The earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth. It was corrupt. 
all flesh are corrupted their way on the earth, provoked by God. Uh, last week we looked at W.G. Gold, William Golding, the author of Lord of the Flies. Do you remember his comment? Man produces evil as a bee produces honey. I believe that man is sick, not exceptional man, but average man. I believe that the condition of man is to be a morally diseased creation. And last week, we, as it were, lifted up the vomit and actually looked at the thoughts of our heart, the internal motivations of all of our acts. We listened to Alec Vidler, former dean of King's College. It is precisely when we consider the best in man that we see that there is within each of us a hard core of pride or self-centeredness which corrupts even our best achievements and blights our best experiences. And so says God, there's a big problem with humanity. And so says God, man is sick. And so says God, dial 111. And so says God, the condition of humanity is that of a morally diseased creation, capable of extraordinary good. And we have seen lots of examples of that over the last three or four weeks here in London. And yet, everything that we do that is good, so tainted by, I want everybody to see, I must tell somebody about it. Oh, I feel really rather good about myself now. Pride and self-centeredness, even the best things. And that's before we come to the envy we feel when somebody else does better than us, even if they're our own sibling. And that's just the hidden things. And we tend so rarely to think of our own human hearts without reference to any bar beyond our own modern day analysis. The concept of a pure, holy, just, perfect, moral divinity is far, far removed from our culture. And so all of our peers, we feel really rather good about ourselves, but that's because we set the bar at ankle height. Anybody can feel good about themselves if they set the bar at ankle height. But when you consider the moral perfection, the purity, the absolute integrity, the goodness, the kindness, the selflessness of the living God. It looks altogether different. Oh, it was in the privacy of my own home, we say. Oh, everybody else does it, we say. Greed is good, even, we say. Moral relativism was described by William Rees Mogg as the spongiform creed of the modern British establishment. God's verdict in his absolute purity and holiness is that we are only evil continually. Not that we never do anything good, but that even the good things are tinged and tainted. Universal, the wickedness of man, absolute, every intention, internal, the thoughts of our hearts, constant. So, Noah means rest, Noah means relief. Yes, this one will bring relief from the relentless pain of living in this world. Yes, you're right to hope for a brave new world. Isn't it interesting how humanity cannot but keep on hoping for some sort of utopian ideal? You find it in communism, you find it in fascism, you find it in secularism. There is a longing for a brave new world. You see it all around us, the politics of hope. We long for a brave new world. Now God says, wake up and smell the coffee, You'll only have it, you will only have it, with judgment. We're told that God, in his goodness, simply has to judge evil, and this flood is provoked by wickedness. Actually, when you stop and think about it, please turn it around and argue with your secularist colleagues who so hate the idea of judgment. If God is good at all, does he not have to judge? I mean, what would your God be like if he just sat with his arms folded over a big fat, fat tummy, smiling down at the witness, wickedness of humanity? What a grotesque God you worship, you secularist. How ugly that he doesn't actually care about the wickedness of humanity. And now right up front in the Bible, God is saying, key stage one. Lesson three, judgment. And if you won't face that, then you're always going to walk through the world like a Disney character, mindlessly optimistic. 2B, 
So that was 2A, it is provoked by sin. 2B, it is deliberate, it is planned and enacted by God. Now, I'm not going to read all of the text again, but I just want us to scan through it on pages 6 and 7 and notice. Well, have a look actually at the end of the Adam account in chapter 6, verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out humanity whom I have created. I am sorry that I've made him. Look at 6, verse 13. God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh. Look at 6, 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Look at 7, verse 4. In seven days, I will send rain on the earth. Forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the ground. Look at 7, 23. God blotted out every living thing. So do you see, in the planning, God was behind it. In the delivery, God brought it. As he reflected on it and explained it, God acknowledged it as entirely his event. So chapter 6, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were opened. It's interesting, isn't it? It's only just struck me, and you may think I'm completely potty thinking this, but it, it seems that the flood came both from below and from above as all the fountains of the great deep burst forth. But God did it. And then in verse 17, the flood of chapter 7, the flood continued. The waters multiplied and bore up the earth, ark, it rose high. And then verse 21, all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. They were blotted out from the earth. Another little note, it's interesting that what the author does is to use the language of Genesis 1 and creation to speak of the deluge over creation. Birds, livestock, creeping things, humanity. Multiply, multiply, to show that this is God's work. So it is a deliberate event. It is provoked by our sin. It is a deliberate event. It is planned by God. There can be no brave new world, no rest, no relief, without judgment. We talk about salvation. That's why I wanted to spend a whole week on this. You know, we revel in salvation. We've just seen kind of examples of God saving work with these friends who have been rescued. But if you like, the other side of the coin, the reverse side of the story is a story of judgment that God simply has to judge. A number of years ago, Andrew Satch gave a talk at a carol service. You know how we all invite all our mates to a carol service? We invited loads of our mates and uh, you know, school gate kind of parental friends and all the rest of it. And there was a guy who came, was a senior legal figure in the city. Andrew spoke about judgment. And the senior legal figure sat next to me afterwards down in our place over supper. And the guy was really rather cross. How dare you talk about judgment to all these young people? And so I said to him, it's very strange, isn't it, that you, a senior legal figure, should not believe in justice. Anyway, the dinner party didn't go quite so well after that. <laughs> but isn't it bizarre that you can have a world? And we are obsessed with justice, quite rightly. Justice should be done about the Grenfell Tower. Yeah, we're obsessed with it. Savile should have faced judgment, justice. We must find justice. And here is the wonderful, wonderful truth that God is concerned for justice too. And so I want to encourage you to say to your friends who don't believe in judgment but are utopian dreamers, think there can be a brave new world, how can there be if sin is not punished? I was thinking of uh, the Lion King. I mean, I guess you are that we are. Should I say we are? No, you are. The Lion King generation. You know, we all grew up watching the Lion King, didn't we? Do you remember when Mufasa dies and uh, the great philosophers Timon and Pumbaa sit there counseling Simba? 
And what's happened to Mufasa? Oh, he's gone up to be, and then they look up at the skies, and he's sitting in the skies. I don't know what he's doing anyway. He's up there as one of the stars in the firmament. Not without judgment, unless you live in Disney World. And most of our 21st century culture does live in Disney World. Oh, we can't talk about judgment. Don't frighten the kids. God talks about judgment in key stage one. So it is good for us to meditate on the character of God and what a relief that he does judge. For if there were a God who thought you could just brush it all under the carpet, what wickedness would prevail? A deliberate account. But then thirdly, it's an exemplary event. So it's a real event, it's a deliberate event, it's an exemplary event. And we have to go here because this book is situated right at the start of the Bible. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, I know we know that. And the way the rest of the Bible handles the account of Noah's Ark demands that we read it in the context of the whole. Uh, several years ago, uh, I was taking a livery company service. I don't know this, but there are all these livery companies that are sort of very, very old-fashioned institutions, and the great and the good are part of the livery companies, and a few others, but, you know, it's the kind of establishment crew. And they were all in, and I was speaking, and I spoke on um, the flood and build your house on the rock, and I made the point that in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the flood represents the final judgment of God, and we should therefore listen to the words of the Lord Jesus and build our house safely on the rock of his salvation. And over lunch, one of the ladies in hats turned to me and said, I'm so glad you're not one of those uh, hellfire and brimstone preachers who talk about judgment. And I thought, well, you must have been fast asleep or deaf, <laughs> or you're secretly trying to correct me. And I want us to see now that Jesus takes this account, he believes it, and he warns us of judgment through it. So would you turn to Luke chapter 17, please? Luke 17, we're on page 1056, page 1056. 1056. Jesus is asked by the Pharisees when his kingdom will come and he speaks about his return. Now look at verse 26. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. In other words, this event this key stage one event teaching us about the character of God, that he must judge wickedness, that there, yes, there is relief, there is rest, it is on offer, but it cannot come without judgment. This is an exemplary event according to Jesus, and there is a judgment to follow. And just as it was in the days of Noah, people were eating and drinking, having dinner parties, going to McDonald's, uh, marrying and giving in marriage, weddings were being planned, they were going to receptions, and then the flood came. So it will be in our day. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. That's on page 1226. 2 Peter chapter 3. Here we have the great apostle. We'll take it from verse 7. Well, we'll take it from verse 5, shall we? They deliberately overlooked this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, not water this time, but absolute destruction, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. There is then, whatever the ladies in hats might say, according to Jesus of Nazareth, a certain real cataclysmic judgment to come. God's justice demands it. You cannot have a brave new world without it. For if sin comes into the brave new world, it will wreck it. So there must be judgment. And of course, this makes the Christian gospel universally relevant. You know, I wish we had one of those cameras, uh, you know, a sort of 
massive great uh, drone that we could, you know, have up on the screens here and pan down, I don't know, into the Eden Park um, uh, pitch on which next week's uh, rugby union test match is going to be played against New Zealand, where we hope we're going to absolutely thrash them. But it, as, the, uh, as the camera pans down into Eden Park, stuff we're through with people, there's not a person who's not going to face judgment. And then we come moving across the Northern Hemisphere and Erin Hills in Wisconsin, where Brian Harmer is about to, to beat Justin Thomas or vice versa in the US Open. And see these great crowds of Americans who will pan down and we'll see here's a group, here's a group, here's a group. There's not a single person not going to face judgment. Kensington Oval, where the Indians or the Pakistanis, whichever side, are currently winning. The camera pans down, what, 50,000 people packed in, not a single person not going to face judgment. St. Helens Church across the city, into this block of the corner, that block, that, not a single one not going to face Your office tomorrow, your flat, your group of friends. You cannot have a brave new world without judgment. The trouble is, it's so unexpected, isn't it? That's the emphasis we get from Jesus' teaching, eating and drinking, marrying and being just the last thing on people's minds. I've met two people in the last six months who have lived through and experienced major full-on earthquakes. And one of them talks of wading through liquefied rock to find his three children in three different primary schools. You just weren't expecting it. Out of the blue. The last thing you would imagine. The whole world disintegrates. And so we can imagine, as Noah hammered away with his wooden pegs, his gopher wood, doing exactly as the Lord commanded. And you can imagine the people of Noah's day. Cynthia just planning the first of her dazzling dinner parties. Now she's bought her new London flat. She's heard that Noah is speaking about some great cataclysmic deluge, but it hasn't rained for months. What on earth is Noah going on about? It's the middle of June, doesn't he? Oh. It started to rain. How strange. Jack just finished the last of his GCSEs, or perhaps his finals, planning his results party. Ju judgment, Noah? What kind of talk is that? You're, you're such an old-fashioned preacher. Get with it. This is the 21st century, Noah. Come on, come out and party. Oh, oh what's, it's just started raining. How odd. Jessica and Jeremy putting the finishing touches to their wedding list sent to save the date to Noah. He was uncertain because he was building an ark. But we're a landlocked state, Noah. Oh, it's just started raining. Martha and Michael, what they're going to do with themselves over the summer months. A, a flood, Noah. Come on, this is a safe space. We, we don't talk about judgment here. How dare you frighten us? If you go on like that, I'll non-platform you you antiquated preacher of hate. Oh, it's just started raining. You see, our utopian friends, whether it's those who preach the politics of hope, or of whatever variety it might be, or people who just won't get their head out of the sand, are longing for a brave new world, but they can't think what they're going to do with human wickedness. If we're going to deal with human wickedness, there has to be judgment. And God in his holiness and purity, justice, and perfection demands it. What a wonderful God we have. What hope is there for human? What hope is there for you, given that the sins, the thoughts of your hearts are only evil continually? What hope is there for me? Well, there's only hope in Noah or that which Noah signifies. And we'll come to that next week. So I hope you'll come back and look forward to seeing you then.